Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're live at a special presentation at BMC Day atop of 60 State Street in Boston, Massachusetts. Beautiful view of Boston Harbor. Evelyn Ehrlich is here. She's the Vice President and Research Director for Service Delivery at Forrester. We're going to talk about job control language in Cobalt. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about <laughs> service delivery. Who, Evelyn? This, so you have a really deep background in, in IT, and I know what JCL stands for, so I had to make that joke. Oh, great. So anyway, um, welcome to theCUBE. It's Thank great you. to see you. You gave a fantastic presentation today. Who doesn't need better service delivery? I mean, it's an imperative for the digital transformation. So again, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about what you do at Forrester, what your area is, and I want to get into your presentation today. Sure, so service delivery, basically, when the application development team is ready, to hand us something, whatever that is, a web service, an application, a service, we actually make sure that that gets to the workforce or to the customer. Um, so anything from a release management, service management at the front end relative to the service desk, ITSM, anything around management of the performance of the applications, the operations, anything like that is all about service delivery. And there were two, <coughs> two pieces of your talk that really struck out to me, um, and I know I've known George for a long time, and so two things, two pejoratives that you don't like to use. One is users, right, end users, right, users, and, and then the other really was IT. Uh, so talk about why those terms don't make sense in this digital economy, yeah, and so what does make sense. Yeah, so users, it almost seems like, to me, it is something where people are putting, uh, folks into a box that they are, that they can, like addicts, you know, a user, like I said, in, a chem, in, in, the, in the drug industry we have users because they're addicts. We have to somehow keep them at bay. We have to somehow keep them low and our engagement with them is no, it's not going to be enjoyable. It's not going to be fun and it's not going to be actually effective. Unfortunately, these users today, those are our workforce, those are our employees, those are our partners and customers. They have other places to go. They don't need us in technology. So if we don't shift that thinking into that they are customers so that we can actually enable them, we might be able to lose our jobs because there's outsourcers and service providers who do workplace services, for example. There's many companies out there who provide a service desk, who provide um, VDI, who provide these services cheaper, faster, and better. But what we have then lost, or what if that's going to happen, we are losing the understanding of the business. We're losing the connection to the business. And is that, that could be a strategic conversation, right? It should be a strategic conversation. It's not just a cost conversation. And when we think about user, it's all about cost. If we think about customer, it's value and relevancy. Okay, and, and of course that leads to not IT, it's business. There's no such thing as an IT project. No, there right? isn't, because anything we do, if we think of information technology, is anything almost like in the back room. It's something which is hidden in a data center, <coughs> somewhere in a storage or in a server or in a device, and it doesn't really add any value. The boiler. And the boiler room, <laughs> exactly. And we and, and we have done, we have massaged it with whatever, we, we measure the heck out of it, we measure mean time to repair. Well, who cares? It's time to business impact. This is what we need to think about. So if we start thinking about customers, the MTTR becomes time to business impact. We're now thinking outside in. And the same is true with IT. If we just use IT for technology's sake to drive information, we're not connected to the business because it is about business. The technology is there to win, retain, and sustain our customers. If we don't do that, we become borders. We become the, uh, the, you know, the companies who all have not focused on the winning technology to make them successful. Yeah, you, 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 had a, you had a real nice graph, simple uh, sort of digital failing, digital masters, and right. everywhere in between, talked a little about things like ITIL and DevOps. I mean, they feel sometimes like counter, you know, counter to each other. One's, one's fast, one feels. How, how, as you talk to customers, you talk to customers, yeah. um, what, what can they expect? How long might these transformations take? Or what are the what are those key stepping stones? You talked about it being a journey. Yeah. How, how do people think about all this this change? That that that's a good question. It's a, a very difficult question to have an answer to, and it, I think it has to it has to be a little bit more compartmentalized. We have to start thinking a little bit more in smaller boxes of influences or or areas where we can make some progress. So let's yeah. take for example. DevOps and ITIL, mm -hmm. and connect the process release 
which is an ITIL process into this notion. Mm -hmm. If we combine DevOps and ITIL release, we are starting to see that the release management process is now a process which is done very agile. Very much, there is a lot more things behind that process and a lot more collaboration between AD and D and INO to make that process a faster process. So we've now married ITIL release management with the journey of DevOps as we are starting to see release cycles of one day. Look at, look at Amazon, what they do. I mean, again, Amazon is a very extreme. Not everybody needs a release process as Amazon has because it's just not that not every business is in the Amazon business. Maybe in 10 years, who knows, maybe in five. But those kinds of things, that marriage happens through more of a design oh, thinking. And I think that's the practical way. Let's not adopt ITIL blandly and say, all right, we're going to just redo our entire 26 processes. Let's look at where's the problem. What are, wh where, where's the pain? What is the 90 day journey to solve that pain? Where's the six months, nine months, 12 months, 24 months, and if 24 months is too far out, which I believe, let's stay in a 12 month roadmap and start adjusting it that way. And measure it. Measure where you are, measure where you want to go, and prove that you have done the delta. Because if I don't measure that, I won't get funding for support. Right. I think that's key. Right. Evelyn, you talked about the you know, prey or predator, right? That's kind of a common theme that you hear in conferences like this. Is it a zero sum game? I um, mean, is, is, are the taxi drivers, you know, the taxi companies screwed? Uh, is, you know, the hotels in big trouble? I mean, can companies, you know, who are sort of caught flat footed, transform and begin to grow again. Yeah. Talk about that yeah. zero sum gameness, if yeah, you will. Yeah, I think, I think there, is, there is hope. So hope is what dies last, we say, right? But there is hope. Hope if customers, uh, if organizations, these enterprises see that there is a challenger out there. And if they don't necessarily stand up to fight that challenge and start innovating in either copying or leveraging or tangentially do something else. Let me give you an example. When about two years we had a, a two years ago we had an event in London and Trafalgar Square was completely blocked off by the taxi drivers because Uber was they were striking against Uber or they were going on uh, on a, it wasn't really a real strike because in London it's a little bit of a challenge with the unions. But anyway, instead of going on a strike, why did they not embrace whatever they needed to? And example is, in a cab at that time, you could not use American Express or Discover credit card. Uber, I never have to pull any money out of my <coughs> pocket because that's a convenience. It's easy, it's enjoyable. We love it, simple. Right? We love exactly. it, it's simple. So why don't these other companies, these companies, the taxi cab, why don't they equip the technology in such a way they can at least start adopting some of those innovations to make it an even par, right? Some of the other things, maybe they will never get there because there are whatever limitations are there. And so that's what, that's what I think needs to happen. These innovators will challenge all these other companies and those who want to stay alive, I mean, they want to because they have, Wall Street is forcing them to stay yeah. alive. They are the ones who will hopefully create the, the differentiation because of that force. And it's not really invention required, it's applying technology and process that's w well established, right? Thinking mm. outside in, thinking mm. of you and him and me as customers. Mm. Yeah, well, and it, and it becomes, you know, who, does, does the incumbent get innovation before the, uh, the challenger gets distribution? Exactly, so, you know, yes. Uber, I, lots of cars, I don't have to buy them, but somebody yeah. like Tesla, isn't necessarily disrupting yep. Ford because they don't have the main, they can't distribute it fast enough. Exactly. So, you know, it depends where you are in that distribution versus innovation curve. Yeah. So, yep. just in a brief time that we have, love to talk about the landscape. So, and it's particularly the transformation of BMC, public company to private, they were under a lot of fire, you know, kind of flattish revenues, uh, you know, Wall Street pounding them, right. and, and you got companies like ServiceNow picking away at the established yep. ITSM players. Um, we're talking off camera, you're saying that's, that's begun to change. Give us the narrative on you know, that, that sequence and where we are today yeah. and so, where we're going. Yeah, so if you go back maybe, uh, maybe way back, seven years ago or so, um, you know, at the start of ServiceNow, they had a fairly easy game because BMC with a very old platform, uh, it wasn't really, it wasn't, there was no fight. Mm. Um, and I think there were, the enterprises were ready for something new. You know, there's always some new vendor out there, it's a new shiny object, and I have teenagers, so they always want the next and latest iPhone or whatever, right? You, so do we I. All, we all do. <laughs> so, so 
And, and it kept going. And the other vendors in the space, HP, CA, IBM, really had no challenge. Had no, no didn't give uh, ServiceNow a challenge either because the SaaS, the cloud, the, the adoption of the cloud in this space was absolutely important. And ServiceNow was the first one to be on the cloud. BMC was not really doing much with Remedy Force at the time. ITSM on, on demand was in an ASP model, not really in an ITSM. And so ServiceNow just took names and numbers. And that just grew and grew and steamrolled, really, all of them. And customers just were like, oh my God, this is easy. I love to, it looks, it loves, it looks beautiful, it's exciting. Uber. And Uber, yes, <laughs> yeah. same thing. That innovation, right, that challenge, they serve the customers. Then suddenly what happened is ServiceNow grew faster than they did. You experience some growing pains, customers saying, mm, my account rep, I haven't seen him for a while. They changed the pricing model a little bit. They started to blow up their solution. They're now bought Nebula, which is an IT operations management solution. They're extending into financials and they're bolstering themselves into more of an enterprise solution which is where BMC already has been, but they lost the connection to their customer. BMC did not love their customers at that time. Now, through some executive changes, to really starting to realize that the install base, they need to hug them, they're back in the game and they're, they're challenging private. service now. And they're going private, as you were which asking the question earlier. Huge. Going private, giving them the funding to invest in R&D And so, necessary. I, I, mean, I wonder if you give, a, give me your take on, on, I see service now as somewhat on a collision course with Salesforce in, yes. in a way. Yeah. Where does BMC go for to expand their, their TAM and to grow? Yeah, I, th I think, so, so on the first comment, Salesforce and ServiceNow, absolutely. Now, the CEO of ServiceNow does not think that Salesforce is his target of competition. I think it has to, he has to, because it is about business applications. It's everything. It's everything, <laughs> exactly. So Salesforce and, and uh, ServiceNow in, I don't know, is it a year? You know, we have a crystal yeah, ball knows, out there, who knows? But they will, they will collapse, uh, they will crash, or uh, uh, you'll see a fight. Yeah. Um, I think BMC, <coughs> should stay and really extend in this digital performance management, in this operational management, and really make it intelligent, intelligent decisions for, operation, for operations to become automated. They have, a, they have a ADDM DM solution, the application dependency mapping solution, happening to be one of the best, really one of the best in the market, and customers love it. Tying that into true side intelligence, giving them the ability to understand before it happens, not when it happens or after, and then drive intelligence into different organizations, the CMO, the COO, the CFO, because that's what business technology is all about. It's not about the IT journey anymore. They have that capability with products, where ServiceNow does not have that. Great insight from a sharp analyst, Evan Ehrlich. Evelyn, Evelyn Ehrlich, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Uh, Forrester Research, where can we find more about the research that you do? Forrester.com, obviously, but that's, that's anything it. new for you? Any upcoming events that we should know about? Where people should watch you? Mm, going to Costa Rica and Nicaragua on vacation. Nice, <laughs> all right, <laughs> we'll leave you alone for a while. <laughs> great, Evelyn, great to meet you. Thanks Thank very you. much for coming on. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. It's theCUBE, we're live from BMC Day in Boston. Right back. <laughs>